Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Jenny Icon. I am delighted to have with us here today, Dr. Karen Sutherland, um, who is here from Australia. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Great. Um, so before we get started, just a brief introduction on Dr. Karen Sutherland. Um, so she is a co-founder and a certified AI consultant and social media specialist at Dahara uh, Digital. Um, I will now hand it over to you for your exciting presentation. Great, thank you so much. So in this presentation, I'm just going to give you some principles that I've learned and I apply in the use of mainly generative AI for strategic content creation. On top of also being, with being a founder at Dharana Digital, I'm also a senior lecturer of public relations at the University of the Sunshine Coast. So the content that I will show you in this presentation is also what I'm teaching my students. I mainly teach into, we have a social media major there. So my real focus is on digital communication. And so I'm embedding the use of generative AI into our courses because clearly students are going to need to know how to use it ethically and effectively when they're actually graduated and, and moving into the workforce. So let me begin. Sorry, I'm just trying to get it. Oh, here we go. So in this session, it will be brief, but it will be jam-packed as well. So I just want to give you a little insight into AI adoption rates, but in the public relations industry, because that's my field. And then focusing on AI ethics and limitations. Uh, we could do a whole presentation on that, but I will just share with you some of those because I'd like you to, if you haven't used AI much in the way of actually using it to create content, you really need to understand these sorts of elements before you go in. Then I have some recommended approaches on how to use it. There are so many approaches to it, but these are two approaches that I have really studied and applied, you know, sort of tried and tested that I, I have found really helpful and efficient. And I will follow those on with how I've actually applied those in uh, some real case studies. So I've been working with businesses. I live in a place called the Sunshine Coast uh, in Queensland, Australia, but I've got two case studies, one of uh, with a tourist attraction here on the Sunshine Coast and then with a an executive who lives in another state just to show how using AI to create first a AI persona uh, and then applying that has really helped them in the content that they're creating and then I'll wrap up with just some final tips for you so let's move in to firstly just getting an idea of particularly in say public relations strategic communication the adoption rates according to one study that was conducted. And so in the study, it said that it's around 68 to 70% of uh, PR professionals globally are using AI. They're finding it quite impactful in their work. They're using it for very specific things like uh, researching, building sort of lists, things to uh, list in terms of contact list, media list, those sorts of things, monitoring and measuring in terms of media and data and social listening, of course, which is a really important thing when you're managing reputation and of course, writing tasks. So this is what we'll sort of focus on. At the moment, I'm researching for a book that will be published, I think it will be next year by Palgrave Macmillan called AI in Strategic Communication. And so far I've interviewed 36 people from around the globe. Some have been uh, PR strategic communication practitioners. Others have been scholars. And then there's been uh, a third of those have been people who work or have founded generative AI tools that strategic communicators can, would actually use. So uh, I will refer to some of the findings. They're very pre pre preliminary findings because I'm still making sense of all the data. And there'll be an industry survey following that. But I'll also weave in some of the things that I've learned as well. And from the, the survey of the, the interviews I've been doing with practitioners, uh, many are, are using it, but not that they haven't sort of jumped in. Um, they're still very sort of doing it in a quite a critical uh, way. They're just sort of easing in slowly because, it, I mean, it's moving so fast. So I guess they don't want to jump in yet. They're sort of easing in and learning what they can use it for while still 
um, you know, not increasing the risk or risking the reputation of their clients in the meantime. So in terms of ethics and limitations, as I said, it's quite a big topic and things keep popping up all the time. So uh, in terms of ethics, there are generally around seven pillars of ethics relating to AI and things such as, you know, accountability and authenticity in terms of the, the information that is being generated by AI and, and how authentic is it and and the, also the accountability when things go wrong. So a good example of that right now has been with um, Google's Gemini most recently because Gemini clearly is only pretty new at actually generating images and trying to sort of overcome the bias that can happen in data. Gemini uh, has been inaccurately uh, generating historical uh, scenes and images. Um, it, I guess it was trained on data so it wouldn't be biased in terms of um, culture and gender and ethnicity, those sorts of things. And it sort of worked the other way by creating, you know, inaccurate sort of historical images. So Google has clearly taken accountability, accountability for that. But the time that we're recording this, it has um, withdrawn the image uh, generator for the moment while they sort of fix that side of it. So that's a really good example of that. Uh, fairness, again, in relation to the data and that it's given and the results that are generated in response, because clearly biased data will generate biased results. The reliability of it. So if you're going to ask it or use it a particular prompt more than once, is it going to keep giving you different responses? The adaptability as well. So is it ad adapting to the world around it or is it just going to be quite fixed in um, it's training. The next is about explainability and transparency. So the explainability is around the actual uh, owners of the AI. Can they explain how it's getting the results that it's getting? It shouldn't be sort of, um, you know, it should be sort of a black box that people can actually understand why it's doing what it's doing. And then also the transparency. So this is one of the big themes that's actually coming out of my research is this issue of transparency and will people be forced to be transparent when they're using AI, particularly in the creation of content. So at the moment, I mean, I know putting this in like a higher education context, students at our university, if they are going to use it, we've sort of, we guide them on what they are allowed to use AI for. So an example is, we have sort of blog writing as, as a task for some of our students and we say you're allowed to use it to help you to come up with your you know your topic and the structure and the title but you can't use it to write and even when you do use it you need to actually uh, disclose that you've used an AI tool to help you with that so this issue of transparency is yeah I think is uh, going to be one of the leading sort of issues that will continue then the next are sort of related. So security, particularly if we're talking about data security and privacy. So, you know, what's happening to the information that you're feeding the AI? Is it safe? And what is it being trained on? And, you know, is it, it private what you're actually uh, doing with the, the, uh, the actual program? Is, with the tool, is, is it safe and is it private? Now, the, uh, the limitations, there still are many. And we, I, I, what I find interesting is that there are many that we haven't even thought of yet, but they keep sort of popping up as we see in the news um, day to day because it's very hard to sort of predict how people are going to use it so you can uh, play devil's advocate and mitigate the risk. So I think there's, there's going to be a lot of um, limitations that pop up that we've never even thought about before. But because, I mean, the, the quality of the AI is reliant on and what it gives you is reliant on the quality of the data that you're putting in. So that's one of the limitations. If it's uh, garbage in, garbage out. And again, that's another thing coming out of my research. It could even be like the title of the book. So many people have said that in my interviews. And it, as we said, it can be biased and discriminatory. So if it's learning for using data that is biased, then yeah, it's just going to keep perpetuating that. It can make things up. 
So that's a real issue, particularly in, in any sort of field, but particularly in a field like public relations and strategic communication, because if you're there trying to uh, protect the reputation of your client and it's generating inaccurate information, then you, um, you, know, you put that reputation at risk. And again, sort of Google's Gemini was a good example of that. And it's reliant as well on how well you craft your prompts. So prompt engineering is going to be such an important skill, and it is now, but I think we have to really teach that as a form of communication to, and to be able to actually get quality out of it. And if you're putting in just really sort of generic prompts and instructions, you'll just get that back. So it'll be very hard for you to actually get the AI to do what you need. Data privacy isn't always transparent. So in some of the, the uh, founders that I've been speaking to, they're very clear in what happens to people's data and how protected and secure it is. But on some tools, it's not. So you've got to be really careful so that you're not putting in sensitive information into an AI tool that you don't know what's happening. If it's actually being trained on that data and someone else who's using the tool, you know, could actually access it in some way. And copyright is an issue that keeps popping up. So I think it was the, the New York Times or, or the New York Post, I think it was actually, who took... Um, open AI to court saying ChatGPT was uh, plagiarizing their content. And I, it didn't really work out in their favor, but I think this issue of copyright is going to keep continuing because it's, again, the AI is being trained on data that already exists. So, you know, where, where is that material coming from? So here are just a couple of approaches um, to generating strategic content with AI that I have found super helpful and effective. This is approach I teach my students and it's it's in, I have a social media management book coming out, so it's in here as well. And yeah, it's just a framework that I developed based on my own experience. And it's sort of the research that I'm doing, the findings that are, are really supporting this as well. So there are really three key stages when you are using AI to generate content. The first stage is preparation. So you need to do your research so and then draft some prompts. And by research, I mean really understanding like what do you want the AI to do? What do you want it to produce for you? What is the, the, the goal of the piece or the purpose of the piece? What key words or, or key messages are you going to include in there? Who the audience is? Where is it going to appear? All of these different sort of aspects of a piece of communication, you need to understand those before you even start playing with the AI tool. And, and drafting some prompts so that you are very specific. Thinking of like the who, what, where, when, how, and why. If you were going to brief, say, a copywriter or, or brief an intern, what information would you need to give them to make sure that they could actually produce what it is that you want? So it's this preparation that will really help you, it will save frustration <laughs> more than anything, and um, it will be more efficient in, in when you're actually using the tool. The next stage is, so once you've done your research and you've written out some draft prompts of, to give to the AI, you actually put those in. The other part of research as well, so if you've got the data in the tool is secure. You may even want to train it using, you know, transcripts from a video or something like that to give it so it can actually understand the voice that you're trying to get it to come up with. But then, yes, in, in the next stage, that's when you are drafting the content using the prompts. And you'll go back and forth. So it's very rare that you will put in a perfect prompt and get a perfect result because it's, life just isn't like that even when you're working with a creative professional you're working with an external supplier there's always a little bit of back and forth in the, in the creative process to refine and get what you need so this is called a chain of thought reasoning so you're optimizing the prompts on this on the fly you're telling the ai yes i like this but i don't like that do it again you know and you're going back and forth to get what you think is going to be most useful and then the final stage is post-production so 
that's when if it's giving you any facts so there are tools now like um chat gpt4 can search the internet using bing and uh gemini as i mentioned before it's it's actually pretty good with written and written text and it can also search the the internet as well and give you sources and there's another great tool called perplexity and that can actually search the internet and give you sources as well so using a tool like that will you'll still need to check the sources to make sure they're correct but you if it gives you any sort of facts or figures if it gives you a quote that someone said or anything like that you need to go and make sure that that actually is real um, that's super important so that's the first stage of post-production just fact checking next is then editing so it it's a first draft generator that's what i see AI, ai as a first draft generator so it'll give you close to what you need but you always need to go in and change it so what i recommend is you you copy what it what it's given you and then paste it into uh whether it's a word document or into uh like a linkedin post or whatever whatever it is but beware because it's so easy to see when people are, are just copying and pasting the, the the ai generated content straight in i mean it's over uses emojis it uses terms like unleash and like really this over the top language that is really quite cringy so the best use of ai is to make it look like you're not using ai so that's why you have to go in and, and edit it and make it look more like something you would actually write so that's um the, that's the, the final thing and then you get it to a point where you're ready to sort of post it or share it or upload it or whatever the final draft and where it, that's going that's the synthesis to final draft so you can see those three stages are really important it's not a matter of just throwing in any instruction copying pasting what it gives you and, and putting it out there for everyone to see again it's strategic content creation so it has to sort of follow a process to get it to where you need it to be another method is uh, the AI persona method. So this method was developed by a digital marketer in the US called Jeff J. Hunter. And so he has a certification now using this approach. And so I've completed his, his courses and, and worked with him to, uh, to learn this. And this is really helpful as well. So it's using something like um, ChatGPT and you can just use the free version but I, the actual prompts are around giving it the AI information about like the specific business. You, get, you create it like it's a, a, a role in your business. So you could make a marketing assistant or a copywriter, a social media manager. You, you give it the information to, to do that in terms of your business, um, who your clients or customers are, their pain points, what your products and services are. You, you, in a series of prompts, you give it all of that information. And then you ask it to write things. What you can do now with something like ChatGPT is also you might even give it the link because it can read links now, the link to your uh, website and then it will better understand you even more. So you're sort of feeding it and, and priming it uh, with information around your business. So then it can actually, when you ask it and prompt it, it can give you something that's actually useful. It understands your brand voice and your, your clients and customer base. So it's um, a much more efficient way to use it and it produces relevant information. And so it can do all sorts of things. So it can create uh, lots of sort of written types of communication as well as now uh, images using ChatGPT4 and sort of the image-based tools. And it will be interesting to see when um, in a few months when OpenAI's uh, text video function also comes out, it will be interesting to see what you can how you can use this approach to generate a video as well. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples, practical examples of how um, the AI persona can work in reality. So the first client I worked with using this are called uh, Yamundi Market. So that's quite a tourist attraction here on the Sunshine Coast in, in Australia. And they, it's, a, it's sort of a, a street market. It's like a big market and it runs two days a week or three days a week but they have like 
got hundreds of stall holders there. So it's anything from like food to sort of, um, you know, artisan sort of gifts and things like that. So it's quite, it's quite an attraction. And I worked with their marketing team. So it was mainly their marketing and event uh, coordinator. So we used an AI persona to create a, a, someone to assist them in their role. Why they wanted this was that there was a, they, they had only a team of two in their marketing team, yet uh, they were looking after huge sort of social media accounts and all the, you know running big events and things like that at, at the, um, the market. So they just wanted some extra support. So in the first session, we spent an hour where we, we uh, set up the AI persona with particular prompts and, and primed it with different information. And then uh, we sort of put it to work. So we first developed uh, an event marketing strategy for an event that they were planning. And uh, we also got it to create some social media content and some Instagram reel outlines and things like that. So in the hour, like it took maybe half an hour to 40 minutes to set it up. And then we spent the last 20 minutes creating a whole heap of content. And when we asked, you know, how much that you would actually have to pay a copywriter for that, they said it would be up to like $3,000 for what we did in just that short amount of time. And so they found that really helpful. When they came back for the second session, we actually created, they were running a Christmas night market. And so we then just sort of kept optimizing that, that marketing and events assistant. And with that, we uh, created a whole heap of content for this night market. So, and we did it in like, you know, it was 40 minutes and there's the list of it all there. So we did things like we did an overall marketing strategy to uh, promote this event. And then the, the social media strategy within that, very detailed around, you know, what they needed to do on what day, what can, who needed to be communicated with. Like the whole planning was just all set out. It was so helpful. And then, uh, you know, some social media content as well. We also helped, if we used it to help us come up with ideas for sort of user-generated content, like selfie stations around the event to try and get people to, take photos and share it online to, at the, the Christmas night market. We came up with ideas, we, well, the AI came up with ideas to try and bring and attract people to the, the night market. It helped us to develop a, a media release, um, a, what to put on a poster and the writing to put on the poster, how to evaluate if like the metrics on how to see if it was actually good, a, a good event or not, an effective event. And then it did like the script for a promo video to, to post on social media and then tips on how to bring in particular micro influencers from the region to also um, get them to, you know, share the experience as well. So in 40 minutes, uh, we actually did enough work that it would have taken a human uh, nearly 40 hours to do just in 40 minutes. So that's, um, I think, a really, really good result. And as I said, you still need to edit it, of course. But I mean, it, as a first draft generator, like it was it was nearly like, you know, it's maybe 70 percent there. So it just needed some tweaks and it really helped to sort of fill the space between uh, Brooke, who was the event coordinator and, and the empty, empty page. Like that's what generative AI is so good at doing, particularly in this concept of strategic communication because sometimes you just get stuck and don't know where to start and it just can help you to get going. It's really, really helpful in that way. And the other case study I wanted to share with you was um, Natasha Dukam Aitken. So Natasha is a, she's an executive who uh, works in a health company in New South Wales. She's a return to work strategist. So as an executive, she really wanted to start to build her brand on LinkedIn, but was absolutely petrified about how to do that. And so she uh, hired me to help her to develop an AI persona that is a LinkedIn expert, really just to try and help to build her confidence in posting on LinkedIn. And so in the first session, you know, we, we set it up with the, the people that Natasha was, would be trying to actually attract um, to build her personal brand and you know and to connect with 
And then we developed like a LinkedIn content strategy and generated the copy for five posts that clearly first draft that she could play with. And ever since then, she's been posting five times a week and in really great results. She's got ChatGPT4 now. And so I've taught her how to uh, prompt it to get some great sort of images out of it as well. And so uh, she's sort of, well, the way I like to describe it, she's, I've helped, it's helped her to overcome posting procrastination, which I see a lot of people and small business owners and executives have because they want to post, but they just don't know how, like where to start. And so this has really helped her to do that. And so now I'll just move into the final part of the presentation, particularly around some, just some tips. Because AI is just moving so quickly and there's always new things to learn. So I recommend just keep learning. There's so many little courses available and some are expensive, some, some are not. And there are some free ones online as well. So there is um, the AI persona method is not free, but very useful in it, helping you to come up with like a really specific targeted way of using it as I described. So I've done those now for a whole range of businesses that it's almost like them now having a, another member on their team who, and it's much easier to, to get the best out of it once you've sort of primed it in that way. I've also completed the, uh, there's a University of Sydney AI fluency sprint, and that gave me more of an organizational view of AI and how um, things to consider when on an organizational level, you're planning to try and implement AI in some way. So that was really helpful. And I know there are other universities around the world that have sort of a, a similar sort of um, course that will give you that, that grounding in that sort of organizational view, that macro level of AI integration. LinkedIn Learning has some great little courses as well. There's, and some of them are only like half an hour. So they're ones that you could be looking at while you, you know, I know you, you should have a lunch break, but if you want to sit at your desk and, and um, have your lunch and, and learn something new, they're, they're good as well. I also can cannot recommend enough the Marketing AI Institute. They are amazing. Um, they do have courses, but they that are paid and conferences that you have to pay for. But they have a free beginners course, and they have an awesome podcast and newsletter that that really captures what's going on in the field and explains it in a really accessible way. So I recommend um, going to their website and and engaging with their material, and of course Google. So look, I talked about some of Google's um, issues recently. But uh, they do have some great courses. They've got a whole suite now of free generative AI courses that are also worth a look. Remember too, when you're using it, it's, it's, it's all about the quality of the data that you're putting in, but it's also all about the prompts and the instructions that you give the AI. So you need to be specific, very specific and provide a lot of context to get what you need from it. And when it's not giving you what you need, correct it and tell it what it's done wrong and what you need. And that helps to train it as well. And ask it what it needs so it, you can, it can give you what you want. So even asking it, I want to do this, what do you need from me to be able to perform the task? And it will, it'll rattle off a whole list of things and information that it needs from you to do it. So it can be as easy as that. Always fact check, as I, I've mentioned previously. And, you know, keep privacy top of mind. If you, it can do amazing things, AI, like uh, analyzing data and customer data and things like that. And if you want to do that, like if you want to use it for that, make sure if you're unsure of the security of that data in the AI, make sure that you remove names, you know, de-identify people so that their, you know, personal and private information is not included when you upload it. And I've talked about this already. It's a first draft. It's never a final draft. Make it look like you're not using it. So all these sort of words like amplify and unleash and all the, like and the rocket. Like it's so easy to see when someone's using it. So don't be that person. Get it out and edit it so that it you know it's you're collaborating with the AI. It's not doing it for you. Keep experimenting. And you'll find too that 
some tools, I haven't found an AI tool yet that does everything that I need. So I often use a range of tools. So an example of this is maybe in uh, ChatGPT for, I ask it to generate an image that has some text in it. It can't get the, they can't get the spelling right. And I keep prompting and prompting. So rather now than swearing at it and getting frustrated, I download the image and I put it into Canva. So Canva Pro, the pro version of Canva, means that there is a tool called, it's a text grab tool. So if you put that on the image, like click on the image, go to edit, put text grab, it means that you'll be able to um, have access to the text in that AI generated image and you can change it. So you can edit it, you can correct the spelling if it's wrong. You know, it, that's just another way to sort of get around it. So you may sometimes need to use a couple of different tools to get the result that you need which is which is fine i think maybe one day they'll be perfect but yeah it's finding sort of workarounds um when you need to and it's evolving it's not perfect but uh human collaboration is definitely required and that's a great thing like it really is and that that would have to be the, the core thing coming out of my research for my book is that you still need a human so you still need a human to check it and you need a human who understands what strategic good strategic content looks like so then you can actually make the changes that are required and so if you want to learn more about any sort of ai topics that i've covered or ai strategy sessions that we run feel free to book in a time with me using this qr code that's perfectly fine the other option is I have a free webinar every month on sort of AI and digital communication related topics. So feel free to email me and I will add you to our list. So that's really it from me. I hope you found this presentation useful and uh, thank you for watching. Thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. And would you have five minutes for a couple of questions? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Um, so working in social media, you must come across, you know, new platforms that start to rise in popularity and, you know, the algorithms change in terms of search and uh, the content that uh, goes viral. Um, yes. I've definitely seen recently uh, an increase in popularity of of TikTok and Snapchat, which I actually haven't started using at all. And I think um, there are many people who are sort of grappling with um, moving onto those platforms. So I'd love to get your perspective on, on those platforms specifically and how to use AI content or if there are any issues with using AI content on, um, on those platforms. Well, look, I know with Snapchat, because clearly as an academic, I work with a lot of younger people and Snapchat is generally used more as sort of a messaging platform between sort of friends. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the only sort of exposure that I have heard about it, but TikTok in, in Australia too is very, we're big TikTok users. And I, I don't think like in terms of sort of AI generated content, I don't think there's much of an issue. They've even got now, I was actually uploading some TikToks this afternoon for myself and there's a little checkbox now that you need to tick, tick if it you, just to actually disclose that you're, you, you're uploading AI generated content. So that's quite interesting. And I think um, there's quite a few people talking about AI, but there's not a lot of actual sort of AI generated content. Sometimes you can see it in that it sort of um, uses a, sort of an AI voice, generated voice over the top of some images. And there is some video, AI video tools now that are actually creating TikTok videos where they're just showing sort of stock footage and then it's an AI voice reading a script over. There, I've seen some of that, but it's definitely not the majority. So I still think um, it's happening. It's probably going to happen more and more, but it's still very much a storytelling platform where it, it's really like people picking up their phone and talking into it. Like that's really the, the most popular um, content on TikTok now. Wonderful. And in terms of the type of like the style of 
language that comes out of ChatGBT, as you said, you know, there's a little rocket emoji and there are certain tells uh, and you can kind of fine tune ChatGBT to have, um, you know, the the style and, and sort of tone of your, your brand, for example. Um, and that leads me on to influencers. Influencers have are super authentic with who they are, their personalities. They have a, a specific style that's recognizable. Do you think that um, AI will help them in terms of, um, and do you think that they still have a role in in uh, sort of social media and marketing strategies today? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people like to connect with people. So I think, uh, I mean, AI will help them to generate more content, I think. But yeah, I think people still, you know, largely want to connect with people. I mean, there are now AI influencers. I'm not sure if you've seen that. And they some, some of those are doing actually really well and people know their AI and they don't care. So um, so I think that might be as well, but I don't think they'll always, you know, ever overcome influencers. I mean, we've always had sort of brand advocates and things like that. So I, yeah, I, I think they'll maybe collaborate with the AI more to help with their content, but I don't think they'll be sort of phased out. Mm, that's really interesting. Maybe there's a, a new business model for, um, you know, influencers who suddenly hit their, you know, mid thirties, forties, they're getting married, they're having children and they want to, you know, keep, stay young in order to be kind of culturally relevant. And then they can, I guess, license out their image or, you know, their personality and turn themselves into an AI so they can eternally remain, you know, in their early twenties. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's super big issue with them because of problems. So they might even yeah, create an a AI avatar of themselves. To, uh, mm, yeah. Very interesting. Um, and then also on the sort of IP side of, of, of things, because you have, you know, commented quite a lot, you know, um, and, and being featured on the news and all sorts of, of things, which is super exciting. Um, I've noticed with uh, the stock image industry that, you um, there's been a lot of of changes there. So we had um, Shutterstock, for example, licensing out images to train AI models. Getty Images, on the other hand, would watermark their images, and then they um, they sued Stability AI because they could see the watermarks, so that the images were scraped. Um, so they were, you know, trying to protect their IP. But then within a year, they've done a partnership, and they've release their own kind of AI tools and they have these blanket licenses for um for their users to sort of opt in essentially for their images to then train the model. And then the the model essentially will create derivative work of the original, you know, photographer's um artwork. So I was wondering what your perspective was on all of that. And do you think that photographers need more of a voice in this space and um or it, would you if you were a photographer today would you be concerned um that you are being replaced or do you think that there's still a real need for good photographers because as you said um AI models at the end of the day it's garbage in garbage out so we do need people contributing to these models you know really good quality content so I'd love to get your perspective on all of that I think there's lots of things at play there. So the issue of sort of copyright, I mean, it, it comes down to are we using people's work without paying for it? So I think that that is, is a real issue. And, you know, I think we, we should always pay to someone for the work that they do. And so I think people are sort of still grappling with that. And I think the um, photographers and their platforms, I mean, maybe there will be some sort of agreement like what you, you – you mentioned where a photographer can opt in for an AI tool to use their content. So maybe there needs to be like, I mean, but that's a lot of individual agreements, you know, so it'll be interesting to see how that is played out. And the other thing is um, the photographers that I know, they're, they're using, they're collaborating with AI. So they're using AI, they're taking photos, but then they're using AI to put the people in these amazing sort of backgrounds and, using it in a way like, you know, uh, Adobe Photoshop, you can do amazing things in um, in Photoshop now with AI. So they're actually using it as a tool to enhance what they're already doing rather than replacing what they're doing. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for all of your insights. Really, really fascinating. And I really look forward to reading your book when it comes out. Uh, do you have a, um, a date set for your book? Well, I hope to have the manuscript done before the end of this year. So it will okay. be sometime next year. So, Fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you have a brilliant rest of the day. Thanks. And would you mind if we took a, a photo? Could I take a photo? Yeah, of course. Link? Let me just get rid of this um, this little floating bar. Hide floating. There we go. All right. Okay. Are you ready? I might just change. There we go. I am ready. <laughs> Great. One, two, three. And let me just check that it worked. Let me just get out of Canva. Or this part of Canva anyway. And do you have many more of